From all of us here at Motor for Change, we would like to apologize for the following video. A lot of the data was corrupt from the audio recording that we initially recorded for this episode. So there will be some breaks in here. I've taken out the space of time that has no audio in it. But there is going to be breaks in the audio where it is apparent that I have taken it out. A lot of the breaks happen during the story section or our normal topic for the week. We will be uploading individual videos of our stories because I feel that the recording does not do them justice. So look forward to that. The corruption in the file actually seemed to delete all of the audio recording that we did for the quote of the week section. Um, so just to let you know, the quote of the week was, I don't think you should die until you're ready, until you've wrung out every last bit of living you can. And that was said by Liba Bray. We will do our best in the future not to have this happen again. Thank you for listening and enjoy the episode. What's going on everybody? We're back with another episode of Motive for Change. We have Josh. Corinne. Matthew. And Jonathan. We hope that everybody is enjoying their Sunday so far. We have a lot of changes to announce. An announce? We have a lot of changes to announce here at Motive for Change um, for the seventh episode. We have a whole new lineup of kind of segments for you guys that we're going to introduce in this episode. So the first one is always going to be a news or current event segment, and that is going to be led by Jonathan. And then we're going to do our normal topic like we normally do. And then we're going to have a segment called What's Happening in Pop Culture. And that's going to be led by Matt, the pop culture expert. I prefer guru, but expert will do. Guru. Nice. (laughs) I'll remember that. And then we're going to do a top 10 section, uh, which is going to be pretty fun. That's going to be led by me. And then the final thoughts or the quote of the week is going to be led by Corinne again. So that hasn't changed. I think that we should just get right into it. All right. You guys ready for the current news? We are. I think so. Awesome. So I was browsing around today, and I found this from Wednesday, May 14th at 5.22. Anyway, a new, a new Vancouver Island restaurant bans tipping. The article just says a Vancouver Island restaurant had, has decided that it will not be accepting tips. Smoke and Water, which opens next month, will not accept tips, according to the National Post. The items will cost about 18% more than other comparable restaurants. This will allow the owner, David Jones, to pay his wait staff $20 to $24 an hour and his cooks $16 to $18 an hour. Do you think this is a good idea? Wow. Ah. Okay, so first of all, let it be said that taking place in Vancouver, which is in Canada, by the way, for all the international folks, even though it is taking place in Vancouver, it can apply to anywhere that has a restaurant involved. Mm-hmm. Okay, in North American culture, it is very common practice to tip the waitress or the waiter that is serving you. Um, and it's just kind of a form of respect. Mm-hmm. Okay, so John, you asked a question of, do you think this is a good idea? Yeah, and a second question. Is the notion of tipping a foregone conclusion? Like, do people tip no matter what, or? Ooh, that's a good point. (laughs) Mm. All right, Matt, you sounded like you had something. Yeah, well, um, the only thing I can say is that I was always taught to believe, and I mean, this is from every instance in which I've gone out to eat. Um, I was always taught that good tips equaled good service. And I don't know about anybody else, but when it comes to tipping in restaurants, which I always do, um, if the waiter or waitress goes out of their way to make sure that we have, like, really great service, I don't mind leaving them a big, big tip because they've gone out of their way, they've showed great customer service, and they clearly deserve it. Um, And I also think that it seems to me, like, just based on the article that Jonathan was, like, reading that... um, in order to in order to eliminate the tips, they were going to increase the prices by like eighteen percent. But to me, 
I mean, I'm assuming they're going by the rate of tipping, which is like 18% of the total bill or something along those lines. And I don't know. I mean, like to me, would you like tip somebody who purposely ignored you the entire time or spilled water purposely at your table? Because I've seen that happen. But I mean, like, would you tip for bad service? I honestly don't know if I would, you know? Do, do I agree you... with you. Yeah. Sorry, John. <laughs> do you think then that it's a good idea to raise the wages and get rid of tips completely? I Again, don't. That's kind of like a. It's hard. It's a hard thing to say because it's, you're just assuming that the tip rate or standard is eighteen percent, which, to me, I can see. I mean, like I heard a lot of um, people say that fifteen percent is the norm, but, again, if you feel that the um, server is providing excellent service. And who goes out of the way to help you? What's wrong with tipping them a little bit more? You've got to you've got to keep in mind twenty to twenty four dollars is roughly fifty thousand a year. In That's wages. A lot, but, <laughs> yeah, but again, I think it's I don't know. I just think it's kind of um, it's hard to put a fixed income fixed thing on how much you think a tip is worth if some people do things that they go above and beyond to deserve it, while others don't actually do anything to deserve it. And we all have seen servers that are like that, you know? Yeah. Do you, th do you think it's wrong then for the restaurant to refuse tips? Yeah. Well, I don't think it's wrong. I mean, like, the yeah. owners of the restaurant obviously have a right to run their business exactly the way they wanted to. I mean, it's hard to say, really. That's just that's just my opinion, you know? It's hard to yeah. really gauge. Well, the other day, um, I went out for dinner with a few friends, and the... My bill, my personal bill, um, came to about $15. And this, our waiter um, at the time, you know, came and we were there for about two hours. He came by at least seven or eight times to ask, you know, how we're doing. Do we need refills on our water? You know, do we need a refill on the pop? Stuff like that. And, you know, definitely how our food was and everything like that. And not only that, but the food was there in, like, reasonable time although it wasn't busy so with all that factored in i gave him a 33 percent tip like i gave him 20 bucks and told him to keep the change but mm -hmm. i'm raising my hand and just realized you guys can't see no, it we um, cannot see this. Like, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> awkward, it's okay we but, know uh, you're there in spirit <laughs> and in voice, duh. But um, I'm picturing it now. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Um, no. Uh, when you think about it, if all of them are getting the same price, like the same wages, and for this, like, uh, hold on. Um, okay. If no one gets tips, right? And how Matt was saying that there's some waitresses and waiters who deserve a bigger tip than others because they. They put an effort to come see you and stuff like that, whereas others really don't. Mm -hmm. And, well, why, like, how are the waiters and waitresses going to feel if those who aren't putting out as much effort are getting the same amount of pay as they are for doing a lot less? Like, you Excellent know? Point. Yeah. Right, right now, though, restaurants are still sharing tips anyway. 90% oh, right. of them. Yeah. I get, yeah. I didn't think of that part, yeah. In, in my opinion, I, it's just a moral thing for me. I always tip, so I don't think it would make a difference how much they were making. Yeah. I don't know. I agree with the raising of the wages, especially for Vancouver. Like, the living expenses are very high compared to where we live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's something else. Was, oh, the schooling is a lot higher as well. So if a lot of the waitresses are students or waiters are students... Okay, so we just had to take a little bit of a break there because Jonathan lives in a very busy neighborhood apparently and there's a lot of biker people and they just happened to start up their motorbikes whenever we're trying to record. So yep. that's what happened there. I forget what I was saying, <laughs> but... We just know we're not going to tip the motorcyclist. We're definitely no. not going to tip him because we do not like his service. Not no. even 1%. Oh, I think I remember, actually. So, I agree with the raising of the minimum wage, or if it's minimum wage. I, I agree with their wages, anyway. Th their wages being increased. But I don't think that they should ban the tipping. Because if somebody goes out of their way for me, 
I know that I want to reward them with monetary value that's going to affect their life in a positive or their life in a positive way. Um, but I don't want any of that to go to somebody else. Yeah. Because they didn't I mean, do anything for me. I can I mean, agree one with note the... I should actually mention is that a lot of restaurants have like a fixed rate for paychecks. So a lot of these waiters and rate bleh, a lot of these waiters and waitresses rely on their tips to actually help them pay bills or help them raise families or anything like that. So I think we have to take that into perspective as well. That some people really work hard to get tips because they really need them. Yeah. And as I said, a lot of them are students mm -hmm. or single mothers or fathers who are trying to put themselves through school and support a family. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the reason why they're doing the job, because if they go to school during the day, a lot of their work has to be at night. Oh, for yeah. sure. So that's my take on it anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on to the topic of the day then, or the topic of the week, I should say. Um, now, this topic is a little bit different. So we want our viewers to kind of open up their mind to this and think about it kind of their own opinion as we move on. Um, it's going to be our dying advice to the world. What we want the world to either remember us by or what we want the world to learn from our death or our life, I guess. Okay. And now what we've done is we've written a paper on it. This was Jonathan's idea. We've it written was. a paper on it, and uh, we're just going to read them, okay? So we are going to go in the order of age, and that starts with Matt. <laughs> okay, well, well, first things first, I just want to say that um, considering the day that this is airing, it's kind of weird for me to read a paper about death, but... Um, considering it go. is your birthday? It is. Before we uh, read on, um, do you mind if I uh, wish you a happy birthday in a special way? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Go for it. Go for Yay. it. Yay. All right. Okay. So <clears throat> keep in mind, I do not sing and get paid for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> None of us so, do. <laughs> okay. So, okay, here, here it goes. This is for you, Matt. Right. Happy birthday to you. You live in a zoo. You look like a monkey, and you act like one, too. Yay! There you go. <laughs> so, well, we've now learned, like we've now learned from this Matt. episode that Matt is a monkey. Yes. 3.3 decades old, how's that feel? 3.3 <laughs> decades. <laughs> wow. Wow. I don't know if that, if, I don't know if that's a polite way to put it, or a, a rude way yeah. to put it. <laughs> Anyways, anyway, going on with the topic of the day, again, it feels kind of weird to be talking about death on my birthday, but we'll just go right ahead with it because this is all about um, leaving behind an epitaph to the world as to what we would want the world to know about us. And, you know, I have to admit that when it comes to leaving my epitaph behind, I never really gave it a lot of thought. For one, I mean... It, Obviously, no immortality is an impossibility, but I also get kind of creeped out talking about death. I mean, it just seems so finite, and I don't want a long, 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 long time from now. But, I mean, the one thing I have learned is that not all of us have the luxury of time, and sometimes the things you leave behind are not necessarily possessions, but thoughts and words. So, if heaven forbid I was to end up dying tomorrow, what would I want them to know about me? What sort of misconceptions about me would I want to clear up? What sorts of secrets would I take to the grave with me? Although I don't really have that many secrets. I'm just being dramatic because I like being dramatic. But, you know, I do have a lot of misconceptions that I want to clear up because I don't think a lot of people understand exactly who I am. So we'll just start with misconception number one. And that misconception is that people in my life have had the belief that I am damaged goods or broken. I'm doing air quotes, but you can't see that, but we'll just go ahead <laughs> with that. Um, and because they were as damaged goods and broken, that they felt a need to try and fix me. Well, you know what? Newsflash, I wasn't born broken, but I was certainly made to feel that way by the very people who tried to fix me under the guise of friendship and compassion. I mean, I'm not going to beat around the bush. There's absolutely zero friendship and compassion in telling somebody that they will never amount to anything because they aren't like anybody else. 
and that goes towards teachers who sent me out of class and forced me to walk around school hallways with books on my head because they said I was walking abnormally. I lost a few pounds, but that was their loss anyway because who wants a friendship based on shallowness anyway? But this does lead to point number two, which is I made self-depreciating comments about myself because I am attention-seeking and want people to notice me. If anything, I was more like a wallflower who hid behind people, but that's beside the point. The real reason I poke fun at myself and make sarcastic jabs towards me wasn't because of attention. I mean, heck, if I wanted attention, I'd go to the shopping mall and run around naked, which is not going to happen, by the way. Uh, so I'm just going to just... Be right Thank out. the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't want that. That's a good but, thing. But if you want the truth, I did it because it, it to me it hurt a lot less when I said it, when I insulted myself instead of letting other people do it. I mean, I thought it was to be I thought it was a really nifty defense mechanism to be honest with you. The more I belittle myself, the less the comments from other thoughtless people hurt. But obviously it didn't work out that way. Because to me, that leads to point number three, which is that defense mechanism was nothing more than bad advice on my part. It was, I like to call it a placebo of sorts. I mean, if it, anything, it taught me that all the people who were against me, I was probably the one who was against myself the most. And I mean, it certainly wasn't one of my smarter moments. Well, let's put it that way. Um, and this goes on to misconception number four. I grew up in a family that didn't have riches, so therefore I was not worth knowing. And I want to tell you something that I never actually revealed on Motive for Change. Um, my childhood was significantly difficult. There were times in which I endured a lot of hardships, which included my family having to move to five different homes by the time I was five years old, just because of, I don't really want to get into too much detail, but it was like all financially related. Um, it did cause a lot of stress within my family. Um, certainly all three generations of the family that was existing at the time had their own stress. And I mean, I don't really remember that much about that time because again, I was only like a preschool age, but the general mood I remember was kind of glum. And I, I hate to admit this because I'm not the jealous person, but I was a little bit envious that I had classmates who had pretty much everything or it seemed like everything. And um, it didn't really dawn on me that even though they had everything that money could buy, they necess didn't necessarily have a lot of happiness in their life. And, I mean, I think I turned out all right. I mean, I do know the value of a dollar. I know how to save money. There have been years in which I've survived and everything that has to do with water, and I've still come out quite well. And I mean, I've become a lot non-materialistic as a result of it too. Um, another misconception that people might have is I'm socially awkward because I have no people skills. And in actuality, peers and unfortunately by some adult figures in my life who unfortunately are old enough to know better, but that's another story altogether. But because they were so judgmental and they continued to judge, so obviously that was their loss because they never got to see how I turned out, which I think is quite good. I mean, some people might differ, but who really cares about those people anyway? My frustration about how things went in my life, and in a way, it is. I do have, I did have that bad habit of venting a lot of frustrations out because, uh, and I figured that if I were to die tomorrow, leaving the message behind would be a wake-up call of the people who did jump to the wrong conclusions about me. It would let them know that I'm not the person they thought I was, that I did not need fixing, that I did have feelings that were more sensitive than other people's, and that I could be a social butterfly if I were treated like I belonged and that I was worthy of respect. So I guess in closing, after I'm gone from this world, I, won't, I don't want people to associate me with negative memories. I want people to see me as sensitive, kind, intuitive, empathetic, and most of all, strong. After all, you don't have to raise a wall or push a car down a hill or lift up a 500-pound barbell to show that you're strong. You can measure a person's true strength just by measuring just how much they've had to go through in their lives. And I think my legacy will be one of strength. I might not show it, but I'm a lot stronger than most will ever give me credit for. Wow. That was powerful. Yeah, Wonderful. that was...
You are yeah. a good speaker. <laughs> it was kind of hard to write at first because I was kind of like fumbling through the words as to how I wanted to express it. So I just decided to go at it with all the anger that I still had inside myself. And it, it was a really cathartic experience, I have to say. It turned out well, believe yeah, me. That was good. Yeah, really good. <laughs> you. <clears throat> all right, so in the order of age, I guess I'm next. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going up for my Grammy speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Knock him dead. All right, so I have a title for my paper. It's called Challenge Accepted Advice to the World. Okay. So, there comes a moment in life where you begin to realize that if you are not moving forward, if you are not progressing, you are, in fact, digressing and moving backwards. I believe that life is all about challenging yourself to be the best version of yourself that you can be. Whether that is becoming a master of academic knowledge in a particular subject area, or gaining all the knowledge that you can in an entire array of subject areas, to become bountiful with knowledge that interests you. Or, you could challenge yourself to become the strongest form of yourself in terms of athletic sport performance, maybe practicing every day to progress to a point of, in musical skill, or artistic talent is more your forte. Whichever the case may be, one of the biggest lessons I've learned throughout my 21 years is that you need to constantly be challenging yourself to become the best version of you in order to be satisfied with the memories that you have created for yourself through the vast collection of experiences you have endured. Create a goal and work for it. Create the memories that will remain with you for years to come through the experiences you choose to challenge yourself with on a daily basis. Life is too short to remain stagnant in a single place for any period of time. Another great lesson I have learned throughout my life is to simply be you. If you choose to compare yourself to the other people around you, of course, your confidence within yourself will decrease. Everyone comes from different backgrounds, and therefore the experiences that they have endured throughout their lives differ greatly from yours. However, what we often forget to shine the spotlight on is our own strengths, and the skills that we have within ourselves that may outshine those of others. You are where you are today because of the choices you have made, because of the experiences that you have endured in your life, and the morals, values, and beliefs that you hold true to your heart. I challenge you to do yourself a favor and stay true to yourself and simply be you, no one else. The use of today often lack the courage to put themselves out there in front of their peers to speak out and be different. The youth struggle to be themselves in the aspects of life that may differ from the norm created by society, a society that is immersed in trying to become so similar to other people that they sacrifice the uniqueness of themselves in order to blend in. In an effort to combat the societal pressure to blend in, I challenge each one of you hearing this message to do something once a week that is outside of your comfort zone. This could be walking up to a complete stranger in the lunchroom who is eating alone and greeting them with a warm, sincere smile. Who knows, you may even save a life by doing so. Or you could record yourself singing and share it with the world on the internet. The worst thing that could happen is that people get jealous of your talent and decide to make fun of you. But why does their opinion matter? Why do we let the negative opinions of others have such a strong effect on our confidence in ourselves, but we let the positive comments wash off our backs as if they aren't true? Take those negative comments and let them fuel you to, be, to keep doing what you're doing, simply because you enjoy it. Allow the positive comments to boost your confidence in order for you to seek constant improvement in all aspects of your life until you have reached mastery in your desired characteristics. The last piece of advice I offer the world is to figure out what matters the most to you and work your hardest to achieve it. If what matters to you is spreading positivity or all in all being positive, don't become it part time, only around certain people you know will not challenge your views. It is the people that do challenge your view of positivity that need that, need that push towards positivity in their lives. If you present positivity in all aspects of your life, you are bound to create the change you want to see happen. The world will always become a better place, in even the smallest of ways, when you choose to become the change you wish to see. I challenge you to figure out what you want, to, what you want the world to hear, the two or three messages you want the world to hear in order for the world to become a better place to live, and spread them. Spread those messages in all ways you possibly can, 
through music, social media, public speaking, and art. Most importantly, let these messages define your character and the way you present yourself in the world. Only then will the challenge be accepted and you will, in fact, become the change you wish to see. Wonderful. Wow. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hard act to follow there, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll okay. be fine. Knock it dead, Karen. You got this. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, um, unlike Josh's, mine doesn't have a title. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'll just I'll just start now. Uh, in one's life, there are many questions that we as humans are faced with. But right now, I am faced with one, and I ask you, I ask you it too. If you were to die today, what would you want the world to know? This could be anything. Now, thinking on everything poss every possible question in the world, there must be certain things that you would want to share with the world. This is a question that must be thought of very carefully, as there are so many possible things, um, but to choose just one, two or three is hard. When thinking of the things I would share with the world, if I died today, uh, I think of the most important things that I care about in my life. One, strength, happiness, happiness, self-worth, and dreams. In my life, there's been so many negative things happen, most of them really hard to deal with. I'm also going to say that I'm a very sensitive person and everything bad that has happened in my life always seems to be worse because I held everything to heart and for a long time. I still do. But there's always one thing that kept me and keeps me going is always thinking of the positive side. That is how I manage to get through those rough times in my life by thinking of all the positive moments, by thinking of how strong I would be if I overcome this. Sometimes it may be hard to find a positive side in something so negative, but if you work hard enough to concentrate, it is sure to come. That is what I did. I took a second look uh, at my past and the negative moments and thought of the positives. What has those negative slash bad memories brought me in strength? Have they made me stronger, more resilient person? Yeah, I think they did. Remember, no matter what difficulties difficulties you face in your life there's always something out there allowing you to become a stronger person along with finding the positives to help overcome all the negative things that may have happened in your life happiness is also is something us as humans need to survive now i'm not saying that happiness is always easy to find but it can hide it can hide within the smallest of places and things some people find happiness within families and friends which is what my happiness is Others find it within themselves, and sometimes people find happiness from giving to the world. Be happy with what you have and are. Be generous with both, and you won't have to hurt. You won't have to hunt from happy for happiness. This was said by William E. Gladstone, a man that had thought deeply of what happiness is and what it means. In order to proceed in life, we need happiness. It allows us to focus on harmony and positives in life. You should be your first priority in life. Life is too short to waste any amount of time thinking about what others do or think about you and allow those thoughts to affect the way you perceive yourself. What is important in life is your opinion of yourself and not the... Uh, C. Joy Bell once said, You can be the most beautiful person in the world and everybody sees light and rainbows when they look at you. But if you yourself don't know it, all of that doesn't even matter. Every second that you spend on doubting your worth, every moment that you use to criticize yourself, is a second of your life wasted, is a moment of your life thrown away. It's not like you have forever, so don't waste any of your seconds. Don't throw ev even one of your moments away. I completely agree with what she says. Life is too short, and it's not worth wasting it on, other on what others think of you. Last but not least, if I died today, I would want the world to know that it is important to never give up on one's dream. Dreams may not always be attainable, but if you set yourself little goals, it will be easier to reach. Before setting your goal, make sure your dream is realistic. Make sure it is attainable. When I was younger, I never wanted to be a princess or any of what class, what's classified as normal little dr girl dreams. I always wanted to be a veterinarian. A vet veterinary <laughs> everyone used to tell me that my dream was only going to last a couple of years it's not really what i want to do but at the time i was convinced my, my dream was to be a vet veterinary 
I really did want that dream to come true, but high school proved that it wasn't necessarily the right dream for me to follow. But that's besides the point. Getting back to the point, I then realized that my life had been difficult and there has got to be more than just myself out there needing someone to support and talk to them, so my dream changed. I suddenly dreamed about working with children, so I set my goals. Go to college, work hard to achieve great grades, and last but not least, graduate from college as a certified child and youth worker. My dream is also almost achieved and I couldn't be more proud of myself. I guess what you should take from this is don't give up on your dreams. All the things mentioned speak about being happy for yourself and believing in yourself no matter what others may say. These are all important things that I believe would, I would tell the world if I were to move on and die today. Don't let what others say affect the way you perceive yourself. Find what makes you happy and grow towards it. Remember, follow your dreams and no matter what you have been through in your life, if you work hard to find positives, you will always overcome those memories and come out stronger than you ever were before. Yay. Very wow, very, career, very nice. good job. Very. Okay, so mine is more in a letter format. And I just want to apologize if I read a little fast. That happens sometimes. But I do have a title for mine too. It's called What I've Learned Along the Way. Dear friends, I'm standing on the outskirts of my life, on the edge of the so-called real world that the last number of years has led up to. And though I can't claim any true credentials, credentials that would allow me to advise you on the rest of your life, I have some things I'd like to say. Remember when you were a child and a world of possibility lay before you? With the magnitude of your imagination, the word can't simply wasn't in your vocabulary. There were no limits, and if you could free your mind, it would be that way again. A dream is our brain's way of showing us what we are capable of chase your dream and once you catch them which you will chase another work hard and never give up don't worry if things don't worry if things are within reason take control if not do what you can and lift the remaining up to god things may not always go your way but then again that's also because it's not always about you remember the times you failed or got your heart don't forget what you've learned from that Try to take advice and maybe one day you'll learn without making your own mistakes first. If you like someone, tell them. If you want to laugh, laugh. If you want to cry, cry. Stand out and don't be afraid, afraid to make a fool of yourself. Do what you want because there is never a better time than now and you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Don't take what you have for granted. Nothing is forever. You never know what will happen, so breathe every moment like it's your last and live every day to the fullest. Friends will come and go, but cherish them all the same. People mess up, forgive them. You will mess up, apologize. Say you're sorry, learn continuously, and always be open to being wrong. When you feel down, remember what you have been blessed with and go squeeze someone you love. Put your heart and soul into that hug and don't let go until you both can't breathe. Every day, make a friend with someone completely random. Hold the door open for a stranger and smile. Never stop smiling. Do you still dance? You should. Keep expressing yourself in your music and art. Are you still spontaneous? Do you still travel? Are you married, Jen? I'll bet she's the most beautiful woman on the planet. Remember what your mom taught you. Put her first. Never let chivalry die and be romantic. Be her prince and treat her like the princess she is. I hope she's not afraid to call you out when you're wrong. That you lean on her for support for the crazy plans, projects, and dreams. You better still be cooking up. Do you have children? I bet they're a handful, which is payback for you being so stubborn as a kid. But I bet they're totally worth it. I know you're scared to be a parent, but you'll do just fine. Our fears and problems are only as big as we allow them to be. So don't allow them to be. It's better to cry over memories made than chances missed. But in dealing with love and your dreams, also remember to make sure you do not compromise the truth. Push yourself. If you don't reach your potential, the only person you are cheating is you. And above all else, remember where you came from, the God who has your back, and that the only thing bigger than your dreams should be the courage to make them come true. If God, for a second, forgot what I have become and granted me a little bit more of my life, I would use it to the best of my ability. I wouldn't possibly say everything that is in my mind, but I would be more thoughtful of all I say. I would give merit to things not for what they are worth, but for what they mean to express. I would sleep a little, I would dream more, because I know for every minute that we close our eyes, we waste 60 seconds of light. I would walk while others stop, I would awake while others sleep. If God would give me a little bit more of my life, I would dress in a simpler manner. I would place myself in front of the sun, leaving not only my body, but my soul naked 
at its mercy. To all men, I would say how mistaken they are when they think they stop falling in love when they grow old, without knowing that they grow old when they stop falling in love. I would give wings to children, but I would leave it to them to learn how to fly by themselves. To old people, I would say death doesn't arrive when we grow old, but with forgetfulness. I have learned so much with you all. I have learned that everybody wants to live on top of the mountain without knowing that true happiness is obtained in the journey taken and the form used to reach the top of the hill. I have learned that when a newborn baby holds with its little hand his father's finger, it has trapped him for the rest of his life. I have learned that a man has the right and obligation to look down at another man only when that man needs help to get up from the ground. To those of you I've helped, thanks is not necessary, for I have been given more joy than any human heart could possibly handle. To those of you I've heard, I seek your forgiveness and your love, but I know loving is courageous and forgiving is hard. And to each and every one of you, Always remember, remember to be who you are. Love those around you. Never give up. Have courage. Be determined. Believe in yourself. Tackle the impossible. Work together and always be all that you can be. No matter where life takes you, wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever you become, I will always care for you and I will always believe in you and your dreams. I hope you chase your dreams. I hope that you make a difference in someone's life, and I hope you live with love in your heart and joy in everything you do. The Irish tell a story of a man who arrives at the gates of heaven and asks to be let in. St. Peter says, of course, just show us your scars. The man says, I have no scars. St. Peter says, what a pity. Was there nothing worth fighting for? My fondest wish for each and every one of you is that you find something in your life worth fighting for. Because when you do, you have discovered a way to unite the will of the spirit with the work of the flesh, and then you, you will be able to help lift up people to a place where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into tiny fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out of, come out of the depths of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its as lot sorry, has not lost its way into the dreary desert sands of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by the ever-widening thought and, and action. Remember to pursue wonder, to challenge theory, and to relish in the moment. In closing, my friends, I say only this. When you get those rare moments of clarity, those flashes when the universe makes sense, you try desperately to hold on to them. They are the lifeboats for the darker time, when the vastness of it all, the incomprehensible nature of life is completely elusive. So the question becomes, or should have been all along, what would you do if you knew you had only one day, or one week, or one month to live? What lifeboat would you grab on to? What secret would you tell? What band would you see? What person would you declare your love to? What wish would you fulfill? What exotic locale would you fly to for coffee? What would you say? What would you do? And why haven't you done it? What? Ooh. I honestly just shed a tear. I'm not even joking. Like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Jonathan, well done, why aren't man. you on TED Talks? What was that? Why are you well doing done, this show man. and not on TED Talks? Yeah, yeah. really. <laughs> That was beautiful. That was. Everybody Thank did such you. a good job. We did. I'm proud of us. <laughs> yes. Give Show ourselves hugs, guys. Air hug. Yeah. <laughs> now, we challenge our viewers to do the same. You don't have to send it to us, but we do want you to think about what you would be leaving the world and what advice you would want the world to hear upon your death. Okay, because as John said very clearly, we do not live forever. So live in the moment and decide what is worth fighting for. Yep. With that being said, we're going to move on to the what's happening in pop culture segment yeah. of the show. Yeah, what is happening in pop culture this week? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to add that um, if you want more pop culture, you can always check out my blog. It's a pop culture addict's guide to life. Um, if you enter it in Google, you can easily find it, but the address is Pop Culture Addict Life Guide at blogspot.com. It is down in the description if you would like an ease of use link to click. Absolutely. Okay, so the topic that I've chosen is related to a recent music release that just came out on Tuesday, the 13th of May. Um, and you might think it's kind of weird because the artist in question has unfortunately been deceased for five years now. I can't believe it's been five years since Michael Jackson died. Can you believe it at all? 
No. no. It doesn't even seem like that long, does it? No. I mean, I remember exactly where I was when I heard the news that Michael Jackson had passed away. I was actually I was actually online, and I guess I had much music on at the time, and at first I thought I heard them incorrectly when they announced that Michael Jackson had passed away. I thought they were talking about somebody else. And I remember earlier in the day, Farrah Fawcett, who was on Charlie's Angels, had also died earlier that day. So I thought everything was all about, like, Farrah. So I thought they would misread the transcript or whatever, but then they confirmed that Michael Jackson had died, and it was, like, really shocking because Michael Jackson was such a huge part of my childhood music memories. I'm not sure if you guys have any Michael Jackson memories just based on – because you are significantly younger than I am, every single one of you that I'm doing this with. But Michael Jackson was huge in my house, and the reason I bring him up is because he has – well, he didn't actually put it out because, as I said, he's been deceased. But um, apparently they found some old recordings of songs that were unreleased. And they just said S-K-A-P-E, which kind of makes the spelling and grammar freaking me shiver a little bit. But anyway, um, there is a regular copy of it. It's in a white cover, and the deluxe edition is in a shiny gold cover. And since we're on the topic of Michael Jackson, I want to ask the three of you and any of the viewers who are watching this program right now, out of all the singles that Michael Jackson has done, which one would you consider to be your all-time favorite? Ooh, ooh, and I'm going to start with Corinne. Yay! Okay. <laughs> uh, mine would be Smooth Criminal, just because I absolutely love it. I like that one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine is definitely by far Billy Jean. Ooh. Oh, come on. Why is that? <laughs> well, I don't really know. I didn't really grow up with Michael Jackson, but at the time of his death, when I actually heard it for the first time, I was at a band rehearsal. It was a jazz band that we ran in the summer, and um, we were actually playing Billy Jean at the time, uh, a oh, wow. rendition. I forget who it was adapted by, or uh, arranged by, but... It was, nonetheless, it was Billie Jean, and I don't know, it just kind of stuck with me. Oh. Hmm. Jonathan? Mine is definitely Man in the Mirror. Greatest mm. song he ever wrote. <laughs> and it's, it's just because I love it. Just because I love it. And my favorite Michael Jackson song is, um, it was one that came out right around the time when I was in fifth grade. And it's a song called Remember the Time. Ooh. And I think it's a song that everybody can relate to because everybody likes to think back to some of the fond memories that they shared. Um, and, of course, the chorus, of course, goes, do you remember the time when we fell in love, yada, yada, yada. And, I mean, everybody remembers the moment of their first love. Everybody remembers their first kiss. Everybody remembers their first time they slow dance and it's just a really great song and the music video for it is really amazing too it has eddie murphy and uh, david bowie's wife amon and i mean it's uh, all of michael jackson's videos are genius but remember the time is especially great nice yeah as if they were all different yeah mm -hmm. before the show we were actually talking you know thinking you know hopefully that they're not all the same i expected maybe one or two of us to have the same but yeah same here Mm -hmm. But no, I guess they're all different. Well, I'm surprised cool. no one said Thriller. <laughs> Horrible song. I think Thriller's well, overrated. Thriller oh, had I a love great it. Great video, but it got pretty repetitive. Really I like quickly. the dance. It made him famous too. Yeah. yeah. And it's fun to dance to. Hello. <laughs> it is. <laughs> all right. Th yeah. That's a pretty good topic. You said you had a second one though. Yes, I did. And okay. this one's actually not as recent as the Michael Jackson one, but um, this is going back 30 years, though. Well, I guess before the three of you were born. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, this is going back to the days in which the number one video game system was the Atari 2600. Oh, wow. wow. And it's like that is a long games. time ago. <laughs> anyway, there was a video game that was released in, I guess, the same year that E.T. the movie came out. It was called E.T. the video game. And it's widely recognized as one of the worst video games that was ever created. I don't doubt it. And it was so bad that there was like an urban legend that 
all the unsold copies were actually buried in like a New Mexico desert, never to be seen again. And a lot of people didn't know whether it was valid or what, but on April the 27th, I believe, I think it was, a tw- it could have been the 26th, but on April 27th, they actually found the unsold containers of E.T. the video game. And I mean, obviously they were like damaged because they had been buried in the ground for 30 years, but they were all there. Wow. So this leads to another question, which is, I don't know how many of you actually play video games, but are there any video games that you consider to be the worst ever? I remember one video game in particular that I played. Um, I love the movie Back to the Future. I think it's one of my favorite movies of the 1980s. And when I saw that there was a Nintendo game version of Back to the Future, I really, really wanted to play it. And I rented it from the video store and I took it back after four hours because it was the most boring video game in the entire world. All you did was just dodge objects. It was like you were playing paper boy, only you weren't throwing papers at houses. You weren't avoiding like bicycles. You were just going down a street skateboarding with really bad 8-bit music playing in the background. It was horrible. <laughs> I forget what I it was called. I don't know if I have one. I forget what it was I called. Don't. Maybe called Paper Boy? It was for the PlayStation 1. Uh-huh. Um, it may have not been called Paper Boy because there was a whole bunch of different mini games. One yeah. of them, I remember you had to deliver papers, but it was like an overhead view. And you just have yeah. to toss them, and it was it was very pixelated, right? Because it's the PlayStation One. Uh-huh. But and then there was another mid uh, game in there where it was racing, but you had guns on the front of your car, and there was eight bit music. I forget what it was called, but that was a really bad game. Yeah, I, I do have one. Okay, I think in general, video games that are based off of like um, products that are released by particular companies are generally bad like some of them are some of them are passable like i remember playing a video game starring the little red dot in the seven up logo <laughs> and i forget what it's called believe me it did exist what? I forget what it's did called, you win? but you played as a little red dot in um, the seven up logo and it was actually not that bad did you win but then i remember a few years back they released a series of xbox games that starred the creepy burger king mascot He's avoiding the question. Did yeah, you win? Did win? <laughs> Sorry? Did you win at the Pepsi game? Oh, at the 7-Up game? Um, I actually made it pretty far, but I don't think I actually completed it. <laughs> wow. Sorry about that motorcycle. He still has stopped. Anywho, mine Problems. would probably be... Mine, mine would probably be Twisted Metal. I just hated that series. Really? I've never yes. actually played it, so I can't judge. You, well, you, you drive around with, like, ice cream trucks and transport trucks, and you shoot other cars, and it was just bad. Mm. It was bad. That was released for the Xbox 360 and PS3, right? And PS2. And PS1. Oh, See, okay. See, that's why I didn't play it, because I'm mostly a Nintendo gamer. I, I wish they would have stopped at PS1. <laughs> I don't remember it coming out for the PS1, to be honest. It did. In my opinion, the best game... The best retro game, anyway. Mm-hmm. Crash Bandicoot. Oh, I love that game. Man, I grew up with that. I could beat every single level. Sonic's better. No, Donkey Kong. Super okay, Mario. Guys. Okay, guys. We're, we're going we're <laughs> we're to leave, leave this topic. We're going to disagree on that, but We're going to leave this topic. It's just an interesting topic to talk about because, I mean, I'm really a sucker for urban legends, and I absolutely love it when they become true. And when I found out that the Atari 2600 legend actually was the truth, I was like, oh, I got to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the future we'll actually do a whole topic on video games and their effect on youth and all that stuff. Yes, we'll have to keep that on the uh, whatever we have. The topic. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe the viewers could suggest it. Good idea. Yeah, you never know. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not that we're begging or anything. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. We are. Well, Matt is. <laughs> so we are going to move on to the next section, which I like to call the top 10 whatever. All right. Um, awesome. this, this top 10, um, you're going to hear a lot of switching pages because I printed out the whole article. Um, but this is the top 10 world changing. These inventions had to change the world in some way. 
Are you right. starting with 10 or 1? 10. Okay. So, the 10th... Um, the tenth world-changing inventions created by a young person, created in 1930 by 16-year-old Iowan gymnast George Neeson, uh, while he was attending a circus. Actually, he saw a trapeze artist finish her routine by dropping into a massive safety net held up off the ground. So, in 1934, he created something called the trampoline. Oh. Yeah. That's sweet. <laughs> However, the first name that he had for it was the Bouncing Rig. And it was simply a, um, a stretched canvas over an iron frame, which we really haven't changed much. We've added springs to it and, you know, a different kind of material for the, the canvas that he called it or that he used. But later on, he added an E to the end of the Spanish word trampoline which means diving board or springboard. Why did he make it circular? I don't know. It doesn't say. I just thought it kind of ironic that the design of the trampoline was based off of a safety feature, like a safety net, but yet people get injured on trampolines all the time. So it's yeah, it's kind of ironic that way. It's funny because actually this article linked to a different article about should trampolines be banned. <laughs> I didn't actually read it, but I just found that funny because he brought that up. Yeah. The ninth world-changing invention created by a young person was created in the 1920s by a name or by a, a man named Philo Farnsworth. Uh, when his family moved from a log from a log cabin in Utah to a brand new house in Idaho with an attic full of popular science magazines. Ideas started going off in the in the young man's head. Uh, before long, he had converted most of the family's household appliances to electrical power. So think about it: in the 1920s, not everything had electricity yet, but he was he converted everything into something that could use electrical power. Ooh. Huh. Um, but it was when a 14-year-old Phil, which was the guy's name, uh, was plowing one of the fields on his family farm. Uh, that he got the idea. He looked at the straight rows of dirt that he was making in the ground, and he suddenly saw how he could have meant a television. He did this by breaking down images into parallel lines of light, capturing them and transmitting them as electrons, then reassembling them on the screen for people to view. Okay? So by the age of 21, Farnsworth transmitted the first electronic image and held the earliest public demonstration of a working television. Ooh. So I found That's that really kind of cool. Coming from dirt, it's really <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly coming from dirt. Wow. All right. Uh, so the the next, the eighth world changing invention created by a young person, is actually something called the Grain Reaper. Okay. So this was That's created. The Grim Reaper. What's that? Be confused with Grim Reaper. No, the Grain Reaper. <laughs> Horrible name. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was created by a Cyrus McCormick. Uh, his father had tried to build the, a mechanized reaper that would massively cut down on the work required to har at harvest time, but had given up saying it was impossible. Then, at the age of 15, Cyrus tried, soon inventing a lightweight cradle for carting harvesting grain, followed by the first ever reaper, which is, which was made of a crude cast iron machine with a triangle shaped knife attached to a bar that harvested up to 15 acres of wheat compared to only three acres before so is anybody there yep yeah okay uh it sounded like cut, skype cut off. just too busy listening um so he definitely changed the world in the fact that he allowed farmers to do more work in less time oh all right. Good, good. Moving on to the seventh one, we have the thermoelectric flashlight, which could actually save your life in a life yes. or death situation. Yes, it can. So, inspired by the story of her friend in the Philippines who failed at school because she had no light to study with, with once it got dark, 15-year-old Anne Makosinki, <coughs> Makosinki, um, from Canada, designed and built a thermoelectric flashlight that transformed the heat 
from your hand into a source of energy Ooh. without the need for any batteries or electricity. Her device, which she calls the hollow flashlight, uses Peltier tiles, a device that produces energy when one side is heated and another side is cooled to help the light last for over 20 minutes. All right. Ooh. Interesting. Wow. She's also spoken on TED, on, uh, on TED Talks. I forget what the TED stands for, actually. Ooh. Great website. Yeah, it's a great website for inspirational videos, motivational videos, and things like that. And I'll even put the link in the description of this video for it. If anybody knows what TED stands for, just tweet us and tell us, because I want to know. Yeah. That would save us some time. Absolutely. <laughs> the sixth invention is a new pancreatic cancer diagnosis. Now, this man has saved many lives. His name is Jack Andraka. Uh, he invented a new diagnostic test for pancreatic cancer at the age of 15. 15? Wow. Yeah. Wow. This test is 28 times faster, 26,000 times less expensive, and over 100 times more sensitive than any other diagnostic ten test in existence. Wow. Yeah. I was, I was barely passing science at age 15, so that's incredible. <laughs> Pancreatic cancer is one of the most lethal cancers in existence with a horrifying, horrifying five-year survival rate of 6%. Oh. Some 40,000 people die of it each year, partly because the diagnosis is often d delivered late after the cancer has spread. Oh. Jack has invented a small dipstick probe that uses just a sixth of a drop of blood. I was going to say milk. <laughs> the sixth of a drop of blood and senses a protein called m mesothylene. I think I'm pronouncing yeah, that right. That's right. That's right. Um, produced by the cancer, taking just five minutes to complete the test. With over 85% wow. of pink, pink, wow, I can't even talk. With 85% <laughs> of pancreatic cancer diagnosis is made late, Jack Androkis might just be responsible for saving untold number of lives. Wow. As an added bonus, it even works for ovarian and lung cancer. Oh, wow. At the age of 15. I know. That's insane. Hey. I know. This next one is kind of funny. Okay. <laughs> Good. This kid created a solar death ray. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So. I want one now. What's that? I want one now. Well, maybe after reading this, you can uh, make one yourself. Excellent. Possible future evil villain, Eric Jackmane, <laughs> created a solar death ray using a normal satellite dish and pasting onto it 5,800 small mirrors. It only took him 24 hours to build from start to finish, and purportedly has the intensity of 5,000 suns. Ouch. How the heck did he, the heck did he get 5,800 mirrors in the first place? I have no awesome. clue. <laughs> <laughs> With what? His allowance? <laughs> yes. <laughs> But in the picture I'm looking at right now, I'll, I'll post a link to it in the description. Okay. Um, they are very small. Uh, so he probably just shattered a, a mirror and uh, did it that way. But that anyways, he says that the... Right. What's that? That sounds about like would be more make more sense. Yeah. But he says that the ray generates enough power to melt steel, vaporize aluminum, boil concrete, and turn dirt into lava. Mm. So, that's kind of scary. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Especially if it's that easy. I still want one, though. <laughs> well, you go Just for, for it. Just for display purposes. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, the next one is an ocean sweeper, which is kind of environmentally friendly. Okay, so I'm going to... Just read the whole article. Out in the vast glittering Pacific Ocean, about halfway between Japan and west, the west coast of U.S., floats what used to be one of our dirtiest secrets, a bobbling mass of plastic, junk, and, ref and refuse named Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Over the past 40 years, it has multiplied 100-fold and is slowly killing ocean life by breaking into tiny fragments and filling their stomachs, starving millions of them to death. While most people prefer to to brush such facts under the rug of their subconscious, 19-year-old Boyan Slat, you, 
uh, instead decided to help save the world. Slot is convinced that the trash, all 20 billion tons of it, can be removed from not just the Pacific Ocean, but all of the world's oceans within five years. In his first TED Talk, he explained that by implementing his invention of floating booms based on the ocean's designs of a manta ray powered by the sun and the waves to capture the plastic, that he would not only make millions of dollars in recycled materials, but even massively clean up the quality of the world's air. That's kind of cool. That is really amazing. So at the age of 19, he's not worried about driving or anything like that. He's worried about getting all of the garbage out of the ocean within five years. Can- and yet here in Canada, 19 is the age when he can legally drink. So Yeah, so obviously he's not worried about that. Obviously not. <laughs> Where's the, he from? Canada? Uh, it didn't say, actually. He has a TED Talk, though. His name is Boyan Slat. Boyan Slat? Yep. If Boyan's watching, he can follow us on Twitter. <laughs> he can. Could you imagine? <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. Thank you for making me famous on Moda for Change. All right. So, the third one is an exhaust filter. Okay. So, 15-year-old Param Jaggi in 2008 really sat atop a stop sign at a stop sign behind the wheel of a car in Plano, Texas. He watched the exhaust from the car in the front of him slowly waft over the pollution wow slowly waft ever more pollution into the air. He figured why why not just turn that into oxygen? He did so by utilizing one of the resources that Every teen knows all too well. Can you guess? No. Nope. He used Google. (laughs) (laughs) He used the great resource, which is Google. Okay? Ah. He ended up designing a small device that plugs into a muffler and removes almost 89% of the carbon dioxide from the car's exhaust through a live colony of algae that sucks in the CO2 from the exhaust and applies photosynthesis and then releases the oxygen and sugar back into the air. That's kind of cool. Yeah. 15? <laughs> Even the cat thinks so. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. We have He's motorcycles and cats. Next Josh. episode, we're going to have a cat riding a motorcycle. What is his name again? His and name... We're gonna offer him seven up. His name is Param Jaggy. Okay. Does he have the moves like Jaggy? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, he does. Probably close. Um, The second one is Braille, actually. Uh, Mm. This was created uh, by a man named Louis Braille. Go figure. Mm -hmm. Um, In 1824, when he was just 15 years old, he... 15 years old, he invented a simple system of small raised dots that were read by touch. Okay, the new language gave the blind access to the same information as their sighted peers and helped them live far, live a far more fulfilling life. Okay, and also in the article it says that Louis Braille received a scholarship at the age of 10 to attend, to attend France's National Institute for the Blind. Wow. Nice. <clears throat> and you know, I've actually tried reading Braille using my fingers and it's a lot it's really complicated for people who are who can see like me, unless you know exactly what the letters are that you're reading. Yeah. But it's fascinating that so many bumps can tell such a elaborate story. It is kind of cool. It's mm. learning a new language is all. Exactly. So the last one. Can you guess what it is? No. Not a clue. <laughs> Pizza. <gasps> oh my god, that'd be awesome. No. Chocolate chip cookies. Something a little bit better, actually. I quit. Tacos. The calculator. Uh, Oh, can't eat that. (laughs) It's not all about food, Matt. (laughs) We all thought it was. So, in 1642, after having already composed a treatise on the communication of sounds of the age of 12, child prodigy Blaise Pascal designed and built the first ever calculator for his father, who was a tax collector. 
Ooh. In a slight fit of ego, he named it the Pascaline. Sure yep. <laughs> the size of a shoebox, it could add, subtract, and indirectly divide and multiply. That's huge. <laughs> Using a series of a tooth of tooth wheels turned by hand, it could handle all numbers up to nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred no, sorry, nine hundred ninety nine million nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine. All right. You can want one billion. You, you have to buy a bigger calculator. Not. Collecting taxes <laughs> over a billion dollars would simply have to wait for the upgrade. <laughs> Egotistical person that you made Pascal out to be. It should what? be important to note that there is a mathematics contest that's named after him in Canada High School. So. What did he name the device? Pascalator or something like that? Uh, the it? Pascaline. Pascaline. It's, it yeah. sounds like a medical rub for sort of It does, something. actually. And you want to know what else? He then went on and invented probability theory, the hydraulic press. What? Of course he did. He invented all the things I hated in high school. <laughs> he invented <laughs> probability theory, the hydraulic press, the syringe, and roulette. While also becoming one of France's most beloved and masterful writers, pretty much because he could. <laughs> Like, still don't like him for the uh, probability thing, but I do like the roulette wheel, so I'll give him a pass. Pascaline. Well, he also invented the calculator. <laughs> I mean, that got me through math. <laughs> so. The Pascaline? What? Or roulette? Both. <laughs> Used every last bit of life you can, right? If that were the case, then yes. I yeah, would want to choose. If you've gotten to a point where you've mastered everything that you want to be... You can choose to die at that point. What, what would you choose? What do I don't you know what I would choose. Like, if, if you mastered everything, would you want to learn anything else, or would you want to die? I don't know. That's a scary thought. And that's not even counting the fact that some people believe in reincarnation, which means they get reincarnated as somebody else, which makes the idea of death seem a little bit laughable. Yeah, that's less a, scary. That, that's a yeah. whole other hour topic. It yeah. is. Well, that is everything from us here at Motive for Change. We hope that you have enjoyed the show. If you have a topic suggestion for a future show, please leave it in a comment under this video. If you enjoyed the show that you just watched, go ahead and show us just how much by slapping that like button. If you really enjoyed the show, slap a friend and then share it with them. Just kidding. Please don't slap them. However, we do appreciate a share. It helps us out immensely. We are on Twitter, at Motive4Change. You give us a follow, and we will be sure that we do our best to lead your way. And one final thing from us here at motive for change be the change that you want to see in the world. Top of the morning to ya. Good afternoon. Good evening. And good night.